listening to KEcast. I'm Andre Goulet. KCAST is a monthly podcast produced by Korea Exposé. We explore Korean society, culture, and politics, and highlight critical, independent voices you won't find anywhere else. Look for KCAST on koreaexpose.com. On this episode... The American military is gradually leaving Yongsan, a major garrison located in the heart of Seoul. The move, which comes as part of a long-delayed relocation plan, has seen the number of residents at the base drop from a peak of as many as 30,000 at the end of the Korean Civil War to just more than 12,000 today. Over the last decade, three main commands, U.S. Forces Korea, the 8th Army, and the 2nd Infantry Division have moved south. Their headquarters are now based out of Camp Humphreys in Pyeongtaek. Bridget Martin of the University of California at Berkeley studies how South Korean landscapes are shaped by the country's unresolved conflict with North Korea. She joins me from Seoul. Hi, Bridget. Hi, how are you? I'm great. You and I also played in a band together in Seoul's indie music community in 2010. Did we ever play together at the Thunder Horse Tavern? No, actually, I think the Thunder Horse Horse came after that particular phase in my life. Did did you ever play there? Uh, No, I didn't. I went to many shows there, though. Yeah, because when I think of it's a one on one. Well, when I think of the garrison, I think of stepping out from the venue early in the morning and kind of seeing those walls across the street. Uh, So I, I want you to help us explore a few geographical themes in this conversation. And I want to begin with Yongsan, which is a 630 acre military base in the heart of one of the world's most densely populated cities. Garrison Commander Colonel Monica Washington's noted that the very complicated process of actually returning the land to the South Korean government isn't likely to begin until July 2020 at the earliest. What can you tell us about this process on a longer time scale? Why was it delayed and restarted? So the idea was first proposed by President or then presidential candidate Noteyu in 1987. Um, and then once he became president, um, they started to make agreements with the U.S. about the return of the land. But actually, the expected cost of the Yongsan conversion started to balloon within a couple of years. And then Kim Yong-sam killed the deal in the mid-90s. And then, you know, South Korea, of course, went through the Asian financial crisis, the IMF crisis, what they call it here. Um, and the, the idea really wasn't really revived until the end of Kim Dae-jung's administration in the early 2000s. So the process that we see happening now is more directly the result of this early 2000 um, movement by Kim Dae-jung and No Mu Hyun. But it's been an incredibly complicated process because, as I'm sure you're aware, there are in the early 2000s, there were more than 100 U.S. installations in South Korea. And so by the time that this by the time this whole conversion conversation made it into the 21st century, um, there were other movements happening around the country um, and discussions about closing some smaller bases near the DMZ, consolidating consolidating forces somewhere south of Seoul. Um, which is, you know, what would become a Pyeongtaek base expansion. So this is a whole, this is actually a countrywide um, geographical transformation. But what most people know about and really see is, of course, the Yongsan garrison in the middle of Seoul. But like you said, yeah, the land should be returned to South Korea maybe in the next two years or so. But even once the land is returned, there's a whole other set of processes in play. And that's kind of what I'm I've been researching the last few years. A major milestone will come late in 2019 when the Brian Allgood Community Hospital closes and a new hospital at Camp Humphreys opens. This is going to trigger the closure of the commissary, the post exchange, the gas station, and more. Yongsan was a Japanese colonial base until the end of World War II, and it includes things like fast food restaurants, schools, a bowling alley, and they're all located behind these high concrete walls lined with barbed wire. It's large largely empty now, but how does the Yongsan garrison compare to Camp Humphreys in Pyeongtaek in terms of its urban relationship to the outside community? This is really interesting. I've actually been undertaking a series of interviews uh, with Seoul residents in the last few weeks and how they perceive the Yongsan garrison past, present, and future. And we've had a lot of different you – know, I've been talking with people of different ages, and they have very different understandings of that space. But one of the things I've learned, which I hadn't really thought very much about before, is that 
you know, when the Yongsan garrison was first uh, occupied by the U.S., well, after after the military government, once it came back during the war, it was very much on the outs- outskirts of Seoul. And it was really in the, I would say, 60s or 70s that the U.S. started to put in more durable infrastructures. So these things like, I don't know, bowling alleys, libraries, churches, you know, it was basically a Quonset hut army for a long time. Um, and at that point, you started to see this vast difference between the surrounding community and what was available at Yongsan. So you see this, this really huge disparity. But, you know, by the late you know, 18, 1980s or 1990s, Seoul had grown so much. You know, Seoul hosted the Olympics. There wasn't such an obvious disparity. But what's funny is if you go to Pyeongtaek now, it's almost like that disparity is being reproduced because the surrounding community is so much poorer than Seoul. And so, you know, I've been to various um, public forums held by Pyeongtaek City, and the main point of conversation is how do we get the soldiers off the base? Because they really want um, soldiers to participate in the real estate market and the consumer markets and to come off base, you know, drink craft beer and have a kind of festival atmosphere, like a global city international atmosphere. But that's one of the interesting things is it's going to be a very different urban relationship in the sense that the traditional um, sex work driven camp town atmosphere might be absent, um, but that disparity is going to remain. Can you unpack camp town for us a little bit? What, what does that mean uh, historically and in the present day context? Yeah, sure. Basically, after the Korean War, there were a lot of displaced people, a lot of refugees, a lot of people who'd lost land, people coming down from the north. Um, and you know, by the 1960s and 70s and even into the 1980s, uh, one of the you know, very good source of income comparatively con- you know, compared to the rest of the economy for some people would have been engaging in sexual services for, for GIs. So it's not just around Yongsan Garrison. You have old bases up in, you know, Paju, Dongducheon, Ujungbu. And where there's a military base, you're going to have some form of what they call in Korean Kijichon, which just means literally camp town, um, which is just basically a local economy fueled by the sex industry. And those there are still camp towns that exist in Korea today. Probably in the late or mid late 1990s, um, you would stop seeing so many South Korean women working in camp towns, and you would start to see more Eastern European, Russian, and especially Filipina women starting to take up those positions. And since then, the U.S. has definitely taken a different policy towards sex work. It's technically forbidden for soldiers to engage in sex work, where it was encouraged, practically seen as the kind of literal lubrication of the alliance um, for a decade or two in the middle. And Catherine Moon wrote a wonderful book about this called Sex Among Allies. But today it is, you know, it's it's um, it is not permitted. However, if you actually visit these spaces, you will see that people find a way and that bar owners find a way to get young women to engage in sexual relationships with GIs in a way that circumvents the anti-prostitution laws. So that's the history of the camp town. And I would also say that in terms of their urban role, in a place like Pyeongtaek, I mean, this is, it's like a specter that haunts the new military-based city. Everything that the city is trying to do is to get away from the Gijichan or the camp town image. And so they really want to stamp out the sex work industry and to turn it into some kind of, you know, global festival atmosphere. Whether or not that's possible, I'm not the one to say. So the 2020 closure process, it's supposed to take six or seven months. This is back to talking about Yongsan again. Do the city government of Seoul and the national government of South Korea, do they share the same vision for what's going to happen to this land afterwards? That is a very good question. That's actually a somewhat opaque topic um, for most people. But my sense is that they do not share the same vision. Um, and I've only really talked at length with people who work in the city government um, and then, uh, you know, some on the U.S. military side as well and some community members. I haven't talked much at the central government level. But my sense is um, that given the way that this land relationship is structured anyway, um, the central government is in charge of 
planning and developing the space. They want to plan and develop it as a, an ecological park. Um, but from the city government's perspective, just in terms of vision for what, what could be, be in the space, um, you know, even today I was talking with a city government employee about, you know, what, what it would mean to preserve some of the U.S. buildings or some of the former um, Japanese buildings that were on that site because the Japanese had occupied that same site since uh, 1904. Whereas the central government, my sense is that they basically see it as a blank slate and an opportunity to undertake a big development project. Um, so that's one level. One level is, is vision, and the other level is, is um, land relationships and who is responsible for what, who gets what money. And there's a whole other extremely complicated set of relationships around around that. The contrast between this kind of superimposing military base and the, the city that surrounds it, it's become a lot more stark, uh, as Seoul has, according to Stars and Stripes, grown from an impoverished, war-torn city to an Asian economic powerhouse. The Itaewon neighborhood outside the base has changed a lot in recent years, and I mentioned the Thunder Horse Tavern at the beginning of this conversation, and then I'm thinking about some of the language that we would just pick up when living uh, in Seoul, uh, people talking about going to Hooker Hill, um, people kind of going to certain clubs or restaurants that uh, cater you know, to a lot of military people. So uh, what's changed? How is it changing? Uh, and tell us more about the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, I've been coming here since 2007, and Itaewon has changed a lot, as well as the surrounding neighborhoods of of, of uh, Kyungidan and Haebongdon. I was looking at a um, city planning document from 2005 recently, and the city was really worried about what was going to happen to the neighborhood once the Yongsan garrison was relocated. And so their basic vision at that time, at least, was to capitalize on gay culture, on black culture, on Muslim culture, and the, the diversity of the space, and to make it the heart of global soul. And I'm not sure how different city administrations carried that plan forward or didn't, but what is definitely evident if you visit Itaewon now um, compared to back in 2000, you know, or the early 2000s or mid 2000s, it is much busier. It's been highly redeveloped, gentrified. Um, it's been made what they call in Korea a, a hot, a hot place. Um, and capitalizing especially on that kind of vision of, of urban cosmopolitanism. And I would say that the turning point was probably around 2012. And around that time as well, you started to see, you know, Hooker Hill, everyone knows Hooker Hill, uh, who spends time in Itaewon. That's, that's closed. The buildings are still there. I think the city would want to redevelop it, but that's closed. Um, but there is a booming gay scene. Um, and there's a, um, Really wonderful diversity of different kinds of clubs and bars there. And um, the streets are full on a level that I never saw in 2007 or 2008. I want to talk about your shift in academic focus. Uh, so you started uh, a PhD program in geography at UC Berkeley in 2013. And at that time, you weren't curious about militarism. Rather, you were focused on locally driven, large scale, rural to urban real estate conversion projects that dominated South Korea at the time. And in the years you spent living in South Korea on and off prior to starting your PhD, you noticed lo how local governments tended to take on kind of ambitious development projects, but then would fall short of their objectives. So um, tell us about this, more about this shift to the work you're doing today. Sure. Uh, I did my master's thesis on Songdo International City. So I became really interested in these large scale projects, like you mentioned. Um, and I decided in 2015, I would start researching Pyeongtaek. And I knew that there were two major U.S. bases in Pyeongtaek, but I thought I could do some kind of project on the city while not focusing on those faces. But I came to learn very quickly that the reason for Pyeongtaek's rapid development, it was the fastest growing city in South Korea at that time, um, maybe aside from Jeju City. But I realized that the military base and the development going on in Pyeongtaek were intricately connected, but not exactly in the way that I expected. And so to make a long story short, basically what happened was that in 
Pyeongchang, between around 2004 to 2006, there were major protests against U.S. base expansion there. And I just um, wrote something that came out a few weeks ago, which was which was arguing that the main way in which the central government sought to quell these protests was by giving urban development incentives to the city. So this meant things like land use deregulation, um, rezoning, lifting of various kinds of development restrictions, and Samsung semiconductor chip factory got a huge chunk of land, so that's going to create a lot of jobs. There were major redevelop, like um, real estate redevelopment projects, which in turn, ironically, actually ended up displacing thousands more people, actually more people than the military base displaced. And so I started looking from Pyeongtaek, I started exploring different places around the country. What's going on uh, north of Seoul, near the border, in Dongducheon, Uijeongbu, and in Paju City, and these places where the U.S. is withdrawing? Actually, in some cases, quite a similar thing. Um, whether the U.S. is expanding or withdrawing, the city government has its own urban growth agenda. Um, so what I found interesting is how the U.S. gets kind of gets enrolled in these different urban 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 agendas in different ways and the different kinds of legal infrastructures and um, debates around who gets what in relation to U.S. military based reorganization. In 2017, you return to see how the dynamics of military spatial reorganization are playing out beyond Pyeongchang. And what did you discover about the general system through which the U.S. returns bases to the South Korean government? The Korean Ministry of National Defense needs to sell these lands to make money to pay for base expansions in Pyeongchang, for instance. Is that right? Yeah, this this turned out to be this is the key issue actually so most people don't think about this especially people you know in the english speaking world who are thinking about demilitarization in a place like south korea when the us returns a base to south korea they don't just return it to the to the local community they return it to the ministry of national defense and so as i mentioned earlier in this conversation the Yongsan Garrison conversion, even since the 1990s, was going to be a very expensive project. And the Ministry of National Defense needed to find a way to pay for it. And so what it ended up doing was just was promising these land sales from decommissioned bases in these basically these poor cities like Dongducheon or or, um, you know, Paju is not so poor. But these less well-funded cities north of Seoul are basically responsible for buying up that land, and then that money gets sent directly to Pyeongtaek. So this is the main blockage for most of the cities in terms of redeveloping their own former military base sites. I was talking to a person in the planning department at Paju City oh, maybe a week or two ago, and he was saying, you know, when we first heard that these military base lands would be returned in the early 2000s, we were all imagining a rosy future. We thought, we, you know, we could put a park there or a theme park or some kind of new industry or something like that. And it turned out that there were all of these different um, roadblocks along the way to actually doing something with that land. And that is that has been the case basically around the country. And so what's actually going on, for example, in Paju now is that the city is trying to find a way around these roadblocks. But what it ends up doing is passing the burden on to some of the most vulnerable people in the community um, by t undertaking its own land projects in order to get the funding to buy the land from the Ministry of National Defense. The Ministry of National Defense will take the money and then send it to Pyeongtaek. So it's become this kind of chain of financial burdening that's getting distributed in all kinds of, of very interesting ways that probably most people who are worried about militarism or, you know, interested in the issue of demilitarization of space aren't really thinking about very much, at least from what I've read. What can you tell us about Umapum Park, uh, the, the conception of it, its concept? This is one of the Paju bases that has been partially developed, correct? So the Umapum Park is a section of the former camp house in Paju. Um, the Park is meant to be a place for overseas adoptees and birth mothers to gather. Um, in some sense, a place for the placeless or a place for the displaced. So this park was initially envisioned by 
actually by left-leaning activists in Paju City who were really interested in he- healing this. This is the phrase that they use, healing Paju or healing the traumas of war in Paju. And they saw it as a place to start reckoning, as an opportunity to start reckoning with the city's traumatic history. So the mayor was on board. Um, he was also looking at this as a tourism opportunity, right? So um, one thing led to another. The city got connected to an adoptee group based in the States. Um, they brought some adoptees who were already in Korea into the site and had an opening ceremony in September. Um, the site has, the park has been criticized by some adoptee groups who don't find that the particular adoptee group that was involved necessarily represents them. It also doesn't do anything for the adoptee community in Korea. Um, but what I find interesting from this, there's kind of two levels to this project that I find really interesting. One is this attempt to overwrite or superscribe or to shift the meaning of this military space or of this demilitarized space by reclaiming the site and by reckoning with history while doing so. Um, as much as that attempt has been criticized or um, called disingenuous by some people, but that, that attempt is there and that's the perspective of, of, of Paju activists. Um, the other aspect of the project is the fact that Omapum Park is actually just one small part of a much larger base. Um, and the city itself had to pay something like $300 million to buy that land back. So this kind of ties back into the conversation we were just having before. They had to pay $300 million to buy most of the land. They haven't finished purchasing it. They got some grants from the central government to do so. Um, but now they're in a financial hole with this project, right? So they actually have a former camp town outside of Camp House called Pongilchon. Um, but ironically, through this special law that has meant to induce development around military base in recognition of the fact that these communities have been so economically marginalized, the city finds itself in a hole. So now it's using this law to try to displace these hundreds of people who live in this extremely poor village in order to make a new real estate development um, in order to get the money to pay for the park development. So you can see how this can kind of create a loop or a cycle of dispossession where, I mean, if you talk to some activists, they might say the U.S. passed the buck onto South Korea, South Korea's central government passes it on to the city, and then they pass it down um, to the people whose land rights cannot be secured. And that's what I find really interesting. And that this special law, it's um, actually covers more than 90 percent of land in Paju because there's so much military, U.S. military and former U.S. military land in, in the city. And that's the same thing for Dongducheon, Uijongbu and other places. It does not apply to Seoul. But what you find now is that a lot of people are actually at risk of displacement. Um, and I think that's one of the, the really crucial things to think about when, when we talk about demilitarization as well. So what is so interesting when kind of uh, exploring this with you is just to be reminded that Yongsan emptying out necessarily means that other places will be filled in. And so, yeah, the Yongsan closure and the deployment of the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense or THAAD uh, missile defense system um, these things aren't contradictory. In fact, they kind of go together. So Yongsan closing simply means that Pyeongtaek's Camp Humphrey, Humphrey is going to expand. Um, and you spent a month living with anti-THAAD activists in Songju City. Uh, what can you tell us about some of the uh, perspectives that you heard when you were living in that environment? Can you talk about that? Right. So just to give folks a sense of what that is it depends on who you ask <laughs> um, it is an anti it's an it's a missile interceptor technology and so the official position of both the US and South Korea is that this is a technology that can intercept missiles coming from North Korea critics have said and you mean critics not not only activists in South Korea but very well reputed people who are um, you know, physicists and weapons experts have, have said that this would be, it would be virtually useless in terms of intercepting any kind of missile from North Korea. And maybe the real reason that the U.S. is deploying this technology in South Korea is actually 
to get a better look at Chinese and Russian airspace because it's not only um, a battery that is comprised of a, a number of, of um, missile launchers, they're anti-missile missiles, but it actually has um, this extremely powerful radar system. So this is what people are actually most worried about. So the people who live near that site, and there are two or three um, small cities and many and several villages near in Songju. Songju is quite a big area. They were initially concerned about vi- environmental and health hazards. But what I found surprising when I went there, um, when I stayed there last July, and I continued to visit on and off in the ensuing months, was how radicalized some of the local people had been. And these are, you know, these are villagers who are 80 years old or 70, 80, even 90 years old who are talking about Lockheed Martin and the corrupt Pakune regime. And so if I had to let people know one thing about what is um, in the mind of anti-Thad protesters, I think that they fundamentally see the Thad deal between the U.S. and South Korea, which was from 2016 with Park Geun-hye, as a corrupt anti-democratic deal. And that they had high hopes for Moon Jae-in to reverse that deal. He had been critis- he had been critical of it during his presidential campaign. And maybe he was under pressure from the U.S. Maybe there are things going on that we don't know about. For, but for one reason or another, he decided to finish the deployment of the SAD system last September. And so we have to think about the deployment in the context of Park Geun-hye's impeachment and the candlelight revolution and um, Moon Jae-in becoming the president of South Korea and this criticism of him that he's not actually undoing this corruption or looking into it at all. In fact, he's perpetuated it. So that's actually the main critique of the SAD System. It's as much about democ- or, um, domestic politics as it is about a concern for international security. Bridget Martin studies how South Korean landscapes are shaped by the country's unresolved conflict with North Korea. She studies at the University of California at Berkeley. Bridget, thanks for speaking with KECast. Thank you. That's KECast for this month. You can find Bridget's Field Notes from South Korea, Local Development in the Land of Securitized Peace at scholarworks.csun.edu. Music on this episode is from Creative Commons. Korea Exposé is an online multimedia platform featuring underreported and critical perspectives from Korea. You can find the KECast archives on iTunes, YouTube, and at koreaexposé.com. This is the fifth and final episode of KECast's second season. For more interviews on Korean society, politics, and history, check out my show, The Korea File, on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. See you there in early 2019 with a new interview. Until then, I'm Andre Goulet. Thanks for listening.